So I have two guests with me today. One you've seen on Grail Country before, my friend Julian, and one new face to Grail Country audience. And this is Laura. Um, anyone who sees or who follows Paul Vanderclay may have seen the conversation she had not too long ago with Paul Vanderclay. Um, Laura was actually the one who had the idea for this conversation. So I'm going to kind of kick it over to Laura and Laura, if you want to explain like kind of what you talked about with Paul and what you'd like to explore today with Julian and I, go ahead. Yeah, so Paul and I talked about problems with Benedict Option style communities. And um, the video isn't up right now. And the reason it's not up right now is that I realized that people were getting the impression from the video that the place where I had lived was just a really terrible place across the board because all Paul and I talked about were the problems. And so then I was sensitive to the fact that people who lived there might see it and might be thinking, hey, we were nice to this lady. You know, now why is she dissing us on YouTube? Especially since, you know, they've been through some struggles and problems in recent years and they might feel like I was kicking them while they were down. So that's why it's gone right now. But maybe if we have a good conversation here um, and, I managed to make some things more clear, then maybe we can unlock my conversation with Paul again and <laughs> just link to this video, <laughs> you know, like for more information. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I wanna make it clear that it wasn't, that the problem wasn't that it was a terrible place and it's not that the people involved were bad people, but it's that there are certain endemic problems with these insular conservative Christian communities. One of them is if it's a new project, that a lot of people who just you know had standard suburban upbringings or whatever are getting involved with freely, then you have kind of a selection problem in that the people who are attracted to the project probably all have really similar personality profiles, very similar concerns. Maybe they're all reading the same websites and the same few books, you know, they're all kind of obsessed with the same few things. And then even if they're all super nice people, <laughs> who are all people of goodwill and trying their best, when you put them all together in one place, um, you know, there, there are slightly crazy stuff, things they might get into that nobody can put the brakes on or they might all, you know, kind of go off a cliff together because they're not balancing each other out, right? They're all likely to be, like if they took the big five test, right? Probably everyone is super, super high in conscientiousness, right? There, it's likely, Likely that people would be high in neuroticism because the kind of people who look around at society and go, I have to get away because terrible things are going to happen. Um, they're probably high in neuroticism, whereas, you know, all their neighbors are just, you know, plugging along like, this is fine, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so th that's going to cause some dynamics, obviously, right? And it's not an individual person's fault. It's, it's just that this, there's this, these spirits are conjured up, right? So people can get possessed by fear or, um, you know, unreasonable fear, or like, a, a, or they can be obsessed with um, how bad things are on the outside, right? So that they're always thinking about like, oh, the bad people that we're trying to get away from or that we're trying to protect our kids from, <gasps> what are they doing now? I need to like check some blog to see the latest outrage, right? And then you're like on edge all the time. Um, and there can be kind of a mania for control because you're afraid, like maybe your main your main motive for being there is I wanna raise good children who aren't polluted by the bad stuff that's going on in society. Then you can be very fearfully controlling of those children because it's so important to you to make them turn out a certain way, right? And you're so afraid of the things they might get involved in. You might end up kind of pushing them over the edge because, <laughs> because you're so controlling of the details of their lives, right? Um, you know, and yeah, people just get these collective obsessions. Sometimes there's a kind of monomania that there's just like, you know, even though the parameters of the Catholic Church, for example, are quite broad, um, these little communities might all uh, settle on like one or two things that like everyone's supposed to be doing to be like a Catholic. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know, even though there's like quite a range of things you can be doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so those are some typical problems. And so I'm not saying that people should never try to do better projects, but if they do want to get involved in something like this, they should be aware that those dynamics are kind of everywhere in this, you know, this world of people who are trying the, the better stuff. They, they, they keep cropping up. Um, 
yeah, but obviously there were good things too. So like um, children were getting a good education, you know, they were reading a lot of classic literature and they weren't consuming a lot of junk media. So they tended to be, um, well, what you would expect people like that to be like, you know, um, like they, they had like a good sense of like how to be a serious person. They had a good sense of morality. They were very well acquainted with, uh, you know, um, intelligent books and, and good aspects of, of culture. You know, they could talk to you about Moliere or whatever in an intelligent way. That's great. You know, I don't, I don't have any criticisms of that. Um, and uh, they did do a lot of playing outside, you know, like playing traditional yeah. kids games. That was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, families weren't um, in chaos, you know, like uh, I, I never had to worry that like I couldn't send my kids to play at someone's house because the parents were on drugs or, you know, um, <laughs> anything like that. Um, yeah, so there are, there are a lot of good things. Um, and if people want an extreme example, they could watch the movie The Village, right? Um, because if you watch that movie, one of the things you notice is that there are a lot of nice things about The Village. Right, like when I when I see the way people are living in that movie, they're having barn dances and they have a cute little schoolhouse and you know they're doing all these wholesome things and living in you know nice cabins and stuff. I think, oh yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to live there, but that obviously there are problems with it too. So, so I would, I guess I would, if I wanted to kind of tell you the whole story and put it that way. Yeah, I think I think in these kinds of communities, it's it's often being a kid in that kind of community is probably one of the best childhoods you can have because of, of, you know, you're, often it's a rural community, so you get to spend your whole childhood just playing in the woods or playing with other, other children. Um, there's this aspect of having all these families living relatively close to each other and, and they all kind of know each other and get along. And so the kids kind of just freely are able to play with each other's, you know, play with different children, play with, go visit different houses. And, and it's, it's kind of just more of a free environment for the kids. Um, but I think as it's probably a lot harder for, for teenagers and, and people growing through that kind of existential phase of life, you know, around the teen years and the early twenties and, um, and sort of starting to ask questions and, and experimenting and, 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 and sort of having to um, make the choice to live in this kind of a community, um, even, challenge some of their theories about faith or whether they want to be a Christian. I think for people um, around that stage of life, it can be probably the, the, the trickiest to, to um, navigate. And it's also the trickiest to how do you, um, yeah, how do, how to raise teenagers or whatever in that kind of environment um, and leaving space for them to kind of find their own way and not try to be overly controlling while also kind of, you know, having some basic structures and guidelines there. I think those are some of the trickiest, maybe for any parent, but I think in those communities, it, it can be even more difficult. Yeah, definitely. So Julian, I'd like to ask you, like, what do you think would be a community like yours, which has like a lot longer history? Like, what, what do you well, think, what would be the primary differences between the kind of community that Laura had an experience with and, you know, and, and your community i think i think the, the biggest difference is um, the the hot ride communities aren't really you couldn't really call them intentional communities because most of the people who live in a hot ride community i mean pretty you can pretty much say everyone who lives in a hot ride community wasn't there isn't there you know because they had some revolution at, at some aspect of modern society or some grand conversion to a, a communitarian um faith or or something like that most of the people um, were born here. This is what they know. This is um, this is what their parents and their grandparents were doing. So in that way, it's it's kind of more like um, I don't know a medieval village or like a Hasidic Jew or some something like that. And so I think um, that that just gives it a completely different um, dynamic. Um, I've thought that, I thought that there's there's kind of basically two different ways about of going about the religious life and one is the kind of modern quest for authenticity and and the sense of of the search and the journey and, and sort of finding your true sense of spirituality 
and um, people always point out this irony about about these conservative uh, people who who join the Catholic Church or join the the Orthodox as you know they're still in the modern mode because you know they they embark on this kind of quest for authenticity and end up becoming the most traditional kind of Christian. Um, and on the other hand, there's there's this older form which is kind of um, more grounded in tradition, more rooted, more, um, you know, this is what my parents believe and we're going to pass it on. Um, and I think that kind of older mode is, is closer to what Hutterites are like. But, um, but, but of course you have, you have the search kind of mode mixed in as well. Um, like I was thinking about this when it comes to um, something like adult baptism. That the difference between adult baptism and infant baptism is that infant baptism kind of embodies that older traditional kind of mode of um, it's it's sort of a rite of passage, but with adult baptism it's more of this authentic you know find your own self choose for yourself like be um, be part of this community because this is something that you feel deeply inside of, um, and so. Yeah, you, you have that kind of authentic, authenticity sort of built into it. Um, but yeah, I, I just find it fascinating to kind of track these, these tensions within the Hutterite world between um, the more kind of traditional way of life and, and the kind of inroads of a more authentic search kind of spirituality. Um, and I think you have kind of both at play um, in our communities today um, and it's, yeah. So I don't know. I think I think just the, the fact that Hutterites aren't really an intentional community probably is one of the main differences between um, between the Hutterites and, and something like a Benedict Option community. Um, well, they would have had to, that, that, that would have been, that would have been the that would have been the origin, though, right? So the question yeah, is, of course, it would have been. So the yeah. question is, is that it, do you think it's here's another interesting question for you, Julian? Do you think it's even possible? for a group of modern people to begin the foundations of something that would have the kind of, you know, lasting legacy of what your ancestors did? I think so. Um, I mean, I think there, there, there have been modern um, communitarian uh, communities started that have been going on for, for a while, like um, the Bruderhof, which is kind of a, a cousin to the Hutterites, you know, they started hundred years ago or so, I think maybe a bit longer. And, and, and aren't the, the kibbutz experiments in, um, in, uh, in Israel also basically that old? So I think it, it can happen. Um, like, do you think there are, there are sort of cultural forces that, that prevent those kinds of community experience from, experiments from happening or from achieving a kind of longevity or, um, yeah. The kibbutz is interesting. My wife worked on the kibbutz when she was in Israel, um, but that this, that actually has been going for quite some time. Yeah. So my a question that I came up with after my conversation with Paul is: is the problem with these newer communities just the fact that they're new, right? And if we if we let them run for a while, they eventually settle into a mode of being that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Right. Be. You got to give people time to figure out how to do it. You yeah. can't expect immediate and, success. Yeah. But but I think I think you know just going on for a long time isn't necessarily. I mean, <laughs> this is something the Hutterites sort of always um, critique themselves for is that you know we we're we we're, we're sort of so old and so set in our traditional ways and and sort of so out of step with the times and so um, rigid and dogmatic in our traditions that we find it impossible to to change and renew and reform. And, and so mm -hmm. the kind of dynamism of these newer communities, the spark, the, you know, what it has all these people coming together and being excited about their crazy ideas, you know, that, that kind of spark is always missing. And so the challenge in, in a community like the Hutterites is always like, how can you get these people to sort of um, become more excited about living in community and, and try new mm -hmm. things and reform and, um, mix things up and, and just uh, renew the, the community life. Yeah, so, that's interesting. H how would a reform happen? Like if, 
if a few people had what they thought was a really good idea for changing something about the community, what would be their strategy for going about that? Oh man, I, I suppose the same way to happen anywhere, like, um, I, I mean, some reform that's happened in Hararat communities has happened with um, increased education. So just um, having, having our own Hararat teachers who, um, who went through university and are educa educating a new generation of students, like that produces a whole new group of people who think differently, who think outside of the box. Um, I guess just having dynamic leaders, um, like having leaders in the community who have a different kind of vision, who have a different, want to go in a different direction. And so it comes from the top, um, how, how it can happen from the, from the bottom up, I guess, I guess just people, um, uh, starting things start, um, like in my community, one thing I've. I've done is start a community book club. And, and that's one way of getting people together and having these conversations. And um, yeah, and, and, and that's been a kind of source of renewal and, and other kind of small things like that. Um, I don't know, I think probably similar to how one would go about renewing the Catholic church or, or something like that, though at a much smaller scale. Um, hmm. So I don't know. Um, I was wondering, are, are the people you were in community with, were those like literally Benedict option people or, or sort of like, were they reading Rod Dreher and, um, and, and the American conservative and, and all of those? They guys? were probably reading his blog, although back, back then, I'm not sure where he was blogging. He may not have been at the American conservative yet. Um, they were definitely reading a lot of Catholic blogs. Right, like I think a lot yeah. of people read Father Z, Father mm -hmm. Father Zolsdorf. If anyone knows who he is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be an example of the kind of blog people were reading. Um, a lot of people read mm, news sites of the World Net Daily type, right? That tell you a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of like New World Order things that mm -hmm. you should be scared of, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, One thing and, I've yeah. I've deeply enjoyed doing is getting is getting acquainted with the, the kind of the the inside uh getting acquainted with the, with the catholic insider culture war, culture war and the oh, dynamics man, between yeah. the traditionalists and the progressives in the church i just i just find it so fascinating because you can kind of perfectly map it on to some of the dynamics in the Hutterite church though oh um yeah i mean it, it's often felt to me that that our arguments are so stupid but when you hear about some of the things the Catholic traditionalists and progressives are arguing about, you're like, wow, we're not quite, we're not quite so bad. Um, right, that's interesting. Do you, do you, are beards important in your community? This is a silly question, but I'm just curious. Um, I, in, in more conservative communities, they'd be more important. Um, uh -huh. Does yeah. ever, Do all the grown men in your community have a beard? Yeah, that's kind of the norm is, is when you get married, you're supposed mm -hmm. to have a beard. Um, um is there those, any disagreement over of, like whether you can trim it or or how much well i guess the trend today is is having like these long hipster beards so mm -hmm. so i guess some people show up with these really long hipster beards and um <laughs> i guess people would just kind of make fun of them or say something like you know you should trim that stupid beard already or something like that uh -huh. but but mm -hmm. i wouldn't say yeah it all depends on 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 like the more conservative or the more or the less conservative communities like um my community is, is definitely more on the um quote unquote liberal side of the spectrum so okay so, so you are those. on the internet right now so <laughs> yeah, that's yeah true. i'm right. an internet on, on <laughs> right. so that is kind of a tell already yeah, yeah. so I, I i had read this book years and years ago better off by eric brendy i read okay. this in probably like i don't know 2006 um and i just reread it and this is a guy who lived in a conservative Mennonite or Amish. He never really <laughs> specifies community somewhere in the United States, but he didn't want to dox them. So he didn't tell a lot of details about exactly what category they belong to. But um, one of the things they argued over was what you should do with your beard. Like he yep. once came upon a group of men 
arguing about whether it's okay to trim your beard, right? Or is, do you just have to have the beard God gave you, in which case it's just gonna grow to whatever it's meant to be, right? Like like, uh, like uh, Nate is going with right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually made a conscious decision. I had been like kind of trimming my beard like a little bit more. And I kind of like, I decided to let it go back to natural mode. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, it's yeah. doing some interesting stuff. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting. Just, now, I, I'm, it, Julian, it's interesting to me. You brought up the whole hipster thing, and and don't you think that I've had the, this beard way before hipsters were a thing? First of all, <laughs> <laughs> and second, but second of all, like, don't you think that that there's a certain aspect of what hipsterism is? Yeah, is, is a desire for tradition. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because Definitely. you can see it in it in its aesthetics, right? It like it it, it wants like handcrafted things and. <clears throat> The, the beards and like yeah. the, the, it's 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 it seems to have be like a desire for tradition mm -hmm. yeah 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 i mean i think i think the the current cultural moment makes our rights look a bit less weird than they would have maybe 30 years ago right um, yeah yeah yeah, I, I have mean, if you look at this. if you look at, at, at <laughs> pictures of Hutterite pastors from 30 or 50 years ago they they could pass for a hipster. I mean, they have right, these big right. beards, <laughs> these little these little black hats, these the yeah. suit the whole yeah. suit thing. Like right. they could, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, like I had sort of an early attack of hipsteritis or whatever you want to call it. Like when I was in high school in the nineties, because I just had this sudden realization at some point in my teenage years that I didn't really know how to do anything. You know, mm. like in school they teach you all these paper skills. But you don't know how to do anything. No, right? that's right. I didn't right. know how to build something or um, grow food or you know care for a goat or any of that yeah. stuff that really like you should know how to do. So I started getting really crunchy about certain things even back then. Like and and my mom would laugh at me, but like if uh, I remember once having to, I remember once making a pumpkin pie where um, I cooked the whole pumpkin and then you know and I scraped the pumpkin flesh out and then instead of like putting it through the food processor which is the normal thing to do where I come from um because it's stringy you know I um I put it in a sieve and I got like a pestle and I was just like pushing it through the sieve to to get the <laughs> pure pumpkin puree and I was like yeah this is how I have to do this because I'm now I'm really doing it on my own steam well I right? think this is why it like, totally I did taste as good like <laughs> because pumpkin pie that still has those little pieces of pumpkin and it doesn't taste nearly as good as the really soft <laughs> um mushed up <laughs> stuff yeah but i think this is like the, okay the whole foodie thing i think that's part of what's going on there too is like it's yeah. a desire for things being done like more in accordance with tradition that's like yeah that's an aspect of what's going on there and for, like i had the same thing growing up too that you did where it's like it's and it's because of our knowledge is information paradigm and for me cooking was the thing that i it was easy my my grandfather who raised me was a chef. Uh, my granny was a great cook. Uh, so that's what I gravitated to toward cooking. And I eventually did that professionally for, uh, for a number of years. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, until I learned to do that, I could, there was nothing real. I didn't know how to do anything real. Like, okay. I, like, I, like I mentioned before we started rec recording, it's like my greatest skill in life is something that is now useless in our age, which was that I was a font of trivia because I retain information yeah. easily, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> now, now, speaking of the crunchy hipster stuff, like let me tell you about it, an interesting tension that happens in the hot ride community. So this, what we've been discussing about, like with the, the rules, like how do you, how far do you cut your beard? Do you wear suspenders? Do you wear the plaid shirts? Like, one thing that's happened in especially more uh, liberal communities in the past, I don't know, few decades is there's this increase, decreased emphasis on these kinds of things. Like there are people will say things like, well, we need to give people more freedom. Um, you know, focusing on the externals is, is a form of a Pharisee. You know, that's like being a Pharisee. And we need to focus on what really matters on um, following Jesus and, and living life of community. So there's this, this kind of positive push to sort of get back to the essentials. Um, but one thing I've noticed that comes as a kind of side effect of that is that this kind of um, crunchy stuff actually sort of falls to the wayside. So um, the, I think Hutterites for many years have been 
have been doing a lot of this kind of stuff without really knowing it. So, you know, you have things like um, community gardens where you grow your own food, you have um, like limitations on technology, you have, um, I don't know, like uh, just the uh, emphasis on a simpler lifestyle and having smaller homes and people getting together more and, and so those kinds of things. But I've noticed that one thing that happens in more quote unquote liberal communities is that there is this emphasis on this sort of individual's relationship to Jesus. So they say things like, well, um, all of this external stuff doesn't matter. What really matters is that you have a relationship with Jesus or, or something. And um, if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you can, uh, you'll be able to, you know, manage uh, technology in a responsible way. So mm. we don't need to um, have any kind of restrictions on giving people phones or technology or whatever. Mm. If they're like responsible um, Christian people, they'll just manage that on their own. Um, and so I've noticed in the more traditional communities, um, they just have all of these older rules. Like, um, you know, there are no cell phones. Um, they, um, I, I can come up with another example at the moment, but I've noticed that this kind of um, pietistic faith sort of acts as a form of disenchantment within our communities and sort of has all of these kind of older guardrails um, falling away and like as much as I, as I as I have no patience for sort of arbitrary rules or whatever um, I think some of these older guardrails do kind of act as a resistance to capitalism act as a resistance to um, I don't know secularization or whatever you want to call it this sort of um, uh, I don't know individualizing homogenizing force um, and, and so I've been wondering, how do you navigate, you know, having individual freedom, having, having people making their own decisions while also being clear-eyed about the ways in which, um, yeah, you, you kind of, something like technology isn't just something that the individual can kind of make its own decisions about. Um, and, um, because because it's a sort of power it has a certain force over you it um yeah it'll change you yeah so in I've, ways you don't expect <clears throat> so i before you there's this it. there's just this weird paradox where um i think people have noted this about the amish as well where it's actually the more liberal communities that end up um giving way to forces of of capitalism and secularity and and all of this and it's the traditional communities that actually kind of resist them more so um yeah. yeah, this may be a time, a good time to ask, um, do the more conservative communities have any, anything like festivals of inversion? Um, I, I've thought about this actually, yeah. Um, yes, yes, they definitely do. I mean, oh. I think something like a wedding in a Hutterite community can be that. I've, oh. I've read a, I've read this account in, there was a sociologist who visited a Hutterite community, um, and this is, um, like up in Alberta or something. And he described what happened um, during the annual communion where they only had the baptized members of the community present at the community service, which lasted about, it's a really long service. It lasted about two or three hours. Um, and I should just note, this is, this is so far away from my, from my experience in, in the more um, liberal community that um, I actually don't even know what to make of this story. I don't even, I can't even imagine how this could be true, but he described how the older members of the, you know, the baptized members of the community would go into this three hour service and then the young people would stay behind and have this absolute hell raising party, like drinking alcohol, um, uh, you know, having this absolute booze fest, um, doing weird uh sexual or romantic things. And, and it was sort of, it seemed like it was sort of accepted that, um, well, <laughs> the young people are going to have their one wild night while we are off it. Um, so, so it's, it's this that's, that's cool. unbelievably I think that kind of strange, unbelievably yeah. strange juxtaposition of like the, the, the holiest day of 
of the year juxtaposed by the, the you know the absolute descent into frivolity and, and carnival um both in very the, interesting in the, during the same time yeah um, yeah that part is really interesting and and you also have this dynamic of um people often talk about army circles of rumspringe mm -hmm. um and there's something uh again this is this is a, a liberal conservative split i think i think this is le less extreme in liberal communities where it it's kind of expected a bit more of um of unbaptized members that they sort of have the freedom to um kind of live it up until they get baptized and then they're sort of then they're expected to settle down have a family and contribute to the community so um yeah i think i i yeah i was charles taylor in um in the secular age talks about how in medieval societies there's this carnival that happens every year and then there's it's a kind of pressure safety release valve that kind of um lets people sort of let off the steam from exactly yeah and, and and yeah catholic communities that i'm familiar with so not just the place where i live but i can think of other projects or places i've been involved in um nowadays the very devout catholic communities don't tend to be tolerant of festivals of inversion and i think that's a problem yeah you know so like when Halloween comes around, they try to make some alternative thing where all the kids go to the church basement and dress up as saints and, and still just keep doing the same, you know, holy things they're supposed to be doing every other day of the year. Um, but I think it's better to just say to the kids, look, here's a 24 hour period where you can be a vampire and you can run around outside and be crazy and get candy from, you know, the secular people down the street or yeah. whatever. It's okay, just do it, you know. No, that's I, think, really I think that's good for people. Yeah, it's and, really good and, point. And, and the, the I, what I should what I should note is the irony is that you know the hard right reformers would have been absolutely horrified that you know there are something like festivals of inversion going on because their vision was like of these communities that are just this bastion of orderliness and cleanliness and holiness and um, you know perfect sanctity. Like there's these images that they have but of. The, the community being like this well-functioning clock where each individual mm -hmm. part has its function or like a well-functioning hive where each bee sort of busily gathers honey and brings it back to the hive. And yeah, so it's... But look at Purim in an Orthodox Jewish mm -hmm. community. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean... Yeah, there, there's... I think that's that kind of thing is inevitable, I think. You, you kind of have to have that. And I think it's actually the, the communities that have that, like it's... It, it tends to work in their favor, I think. Yeah. So, I, well, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have some of the, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, yeah, th th there is a part of me that would like to kind of be able to resist some of those natural dynamics. But um, yeah, I definitely see that. You do, do have to leave room for the margins and, and all of that. Um, credit yeah, that's to fascinating. John, credit that's to so Jonathan cool. Petro there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so 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 you do think do you do do you think it is possible for um these kind of modern projects to kind of create these kind of communities to be successful then i i, I think you kind of indicated you do think it's possible julian but i just wanted to can i just get a like a more unambiguous like answer to that yeah, I think I think it is possible. Um, I think um, going back to Rodrier and and the Benedict option, um, one issue I had with the book was the fact that he was kind of presenting the Benedict option as a response to secularity or mm. um, or, or kind of modern dynamics or whatever. And I think um, the community has to come from a more positive place. Like, like you have to be positively motivated for, you know, you want to live in community as um, an expression of love of neighbor or love of God, or um, because you think this is the best way to live a radical fulfilled Christian life, that this is the vision of human flourishing. I think um, without that kind of positive vision, you're going to have some of those dynamics of, you know, people are being afraid, people being um, paranoid. Um, so 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you also point. avoid this notion that somehow everything was okay if you just roll back to the clock to the 50s and there's no gay marriage and no abortion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that it was a Christian yeah. paradise. Yeah. No, and, and no, that's not an accurate view of history at all. Yeah. <laughs> And that so, can be that can be part of the motivation people have too. Is like let's just revert back to simpler times and get together in community because um, yeah, we can recreate uh, whatever used to be the better society. Okay, I have a great quote from *I Robot*. You know, by Isaac Asimov. <laughs> okay, there's a story where he describes some people who are called fundamentalists. And he says, essentially, they were those who had not adapted themselves to what had once been called the atomic age. They were simple lifers, hungering after a life, which to those who lived it had probably appeared not so simple, and who had not been, therefore, simple lifers themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, I wonder, is the, is the longing for a simpler life, um, is that a deeper longing for you know, for, for, for something real, something human, something genuine yeah. that then gets corrupted in, in various ways. It gets kind of projected back to the 1950s or it gets projected into some, um, I don't know, future liberal utopia or something. And um, yeah, maybe there's a genuine real longing underneath there that people try to concretize in a specific historical time and that's when it gets corrupted yeah in the catholic world a lot of people would love to be running saint Teresa of Lisieux's household right like they admire louis and zaley martin who are her parents who are canonized now and they think i want to have that household and i want to raise saint Teresa of Lisieux. you know like that's that would be the perfect life if i could do it <laughs> um but you don't live in a small town in 19th century france right like so if, if all you do is read a book about them and then go, okay, I'm going to recreate this household, it's, it's not going to work. The things you're going to have to do to recreate that household are going to be too weird <laughs> and too, like, uh, too rigid, right? Whereas for them, in terms of having a certain kind of household, just the fact that they lived in that village in 19th century France was doing a lot of the work for them, you know? Um, and they just happen to be very devout people. But if you want to be like them, it's it's not just that you're going to be devout; it's that you're going to try to try to do a historical reenactment of all this other stuff that you don't actually know it firsthand. All you know is that you read one book about them, you know. Yeah. So yeah, that's difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, the the key might be to identify what is it that you find beautiful and compelling about mm -hmm. this life, um, like like or 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 maybe to do it to do a kind of do it negatively, what is it that you find alienating and, um, uh, and awful about living in, in the modern world? And what are some things you can do practically um, in, in your direct um, sort of environment to kind of foster community, foster celebration, foster um, a connection with nature, foster, um, you know, less reliance on, on technology, um, what what can you do practically in your real life environment? Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, you I, know, at Julia, least in my established I think, community, I, that's... maybe maybe you don't know how to articulate it, but I think you do know because when you were talking earlier about these sort of like individualistic impulses that you're kind of infiltrating some of the more liberal communities, yeah. Right. And, and how somehow like the conservative community seemed to more be, be more resistant to that, mm -hmm. even even though neither side could probably articulate it and you're having a hard time articulating it here. Isn't it possible that the that the thing oh, that you're muted. Is, Sorry. Oh, I'm OK. Well, I can hear you. Oh, I'm not. I'm not oh, Laura can, hear can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yeah. OK. I, OK. All right. <laughs> but I didn't mind. So, so the question I want to ask is that if if the individualism itself isn't the cause? Well, I mean, the individualism, what is, I mean, okay, this, I'll try to articulate more, more in, in trying to flesh out more what I see as the problem in, in, in these liberal communities. Um, it's just that 
there is a loss of the social communal dimension of the faith and people assume that it's they assume that that a community is made up of a bunch of individuals that have like this heartfelt desire to be part of a community and then every all the magic happens from these individuals getting together and they miss the the systemic the 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 um the, the principalities and powers that are at play they miss the fact that um even if you have these wonderful individuals getting together um you're still going to have these these forces of um technology and individualism and secularity and um all of this kind of stuff that's going to be sort of impinging on the community life and sort of driving driving this community apart and and um and stopping it from um living genuinely free lives so being able to it'll, it'll be stopping them from being able to connect with nature it'll stop them from being able to resist capitalism it'll stop them from being able to uh you know go down the line all of these whatever whatever value you want to um embody it's going to kind of stop it and and so this focus on the individual misses the fact that we as a community have to do some practical things we're going to have to make some hard decisions about how do we resist um technology how do we resist community how are we going to um you know do farming how are we going to do manufacturing how are we going to build the architecture of our houses to foster community how are we going to structure our communities so that we can live in a more natural environment so that our children can um enjoy uh you know the, the air on the ground and um how can we and and so those kind of systemic things are just missing with this focus on the individual but um that said like this individualism is is, is the problem but obvious it, it's just not an option um i think i can i can just see it so there's there's all of these tensions between the traditionalists and the progressives in all of these traditions like you have it in the catholics you have it in the hutterites and it's obvious for me looking at some of the more conservative communities that whatever they're doing um like while i can in my more generous moments see some some good side effects it's obvious that we can't go back there and that what they're doing doesn't really work and isn't going to work because they don't they're not the 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 sort of rules they have in place aren't there in any kind of intentional way they're not really intentional about you know resisting capitalism or um being more in tune with nature or um whatever um being less consumeristic um it's it's sort of just um this this traditional way of life that doesn't really um have any kind of intentional resistance and so uh they're just sort of holding on to um rules and traditions without really knowing why mm. um yeah so you mean the problem of the problem of focusing on the rule itself rather than the larger thing that the rule yeah. is, is trying to keep you in tune yeah. with yeah yeah what is the what is the the positive vision you're trying to embody and how can you mm -hmm. um work towards it as a community as individuals um yeah so how do you That's, guys hash out these issues do you have meetings where the agenda is just all about like uh let's check up on what exactly we should be doing and how <laughs> <laughs> um i would say most of these conversations happen informally uh -huh. um yeah i don't <laughs> um i wish we would be having more of these kinds of conversations at at the highest levels of the church but i don't think we are um i think we're um yeah we're we're talking more about discrete questions like what do we do about this specific issue and if you kind of step back you can see why it is we're talking about this issue as opposed to and sort of see the deeper ramifications of going this way or that way but i don't think um yeah i i don't think people are seeing these deeper dynamics at play how are people chosen for leadership roles um the holy spirit picks them do you do that <laughs> not well there's actually an interesting it, it's basically um the the community basically selects some candidates and so that's the kind of human side and then 
the candidates are put in a hat and randomly chosen. So there's a kind of uh -huh. so human and, yeah. and spiritual dynamic there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there's a process like that is, is described in this book too. So. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I was struck by the way the Catholics chose, I was reading an account of Pope Francis election and I was struck by how they chose the, the Pope and it was like the, the, the politics yeah. involved are just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Nate, do you have any thoughts on, on the question you asked me? Yeah, so what I'm, I was actually trying to get a little bit, a little bit deeper layer than that. What I'm suggesting is that the reason for that people are finding themselves longing to build these kinds of communities um, is a product of our individualism because it is, it's, le it's left us feeling it's left us feeling isolated and we want something we want something more and i would I, I would say in defense of your of your more conservative communities like their inability to like maybe maybe they can't say exactly why they maybe would not say that we're doing these things to defend against capitalism or you know en encroachment of secularity or, or whatever I don't think you need to have an articulable reason, right? So like, like Orthodox Jews will, will like generally will say that, you know, they won't try to rationalize like why they follow the law. It's the, these are the things that God told us to do. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that's the answer. And then the process of like, there's a way that the, that the practice of these rules, it becomes a way of expressing love. It is a relational act. I do these things because this is what my people do because I love my people. Mm -hmm. So there doesn't have to be a reason. Of, there doesn't have to be a reason other than that. So it's actually like the modern, you know, atomized, isolated individual who thinks that, that I have to have a reason to do this. I can't just do this because this is the thing that my people do. And yeah, and 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 from my perspective, like trying to sit here and and sort of diagnose. Um, on the one hand, the, the, the maladies of, of the Hutterite culture and, and then the dynamics of living in the modern world and then trying to kind of craft and intellectualize a response like that, that is absolutely exhausting to sort of try to um, you know, navigate those tensions and kind of um, articulate what, what the best way forward is. Like that is um, paralyzing to try to sort of work it out um, intellectually um and i don't i don't know if it's gonna work i don't think and and then how do you mobilize um all of these people to sort of adopt your vision of what the church should be and how we should be responding to oh there we go and now now culture. julian raised it before oh, i can even church? ask the question <laughs> oh, no. because i think that is that is an under that is the question that is underneath our question i think is like and, what and what think... do we concede the church to be and I think everyone has this problem. Like Nate, you're you're an intellectual guy, Laura. You like you're you're intellectually minded. Like you have your ideas. You have you see things wrong with the culture. You would like the church to be doing some things, but how do you when you have it all worked out in your head? But how do you kind of make it happen in real life? It's right. a very different uh -huh. thing. Uh huh. Um, yeah, and one of the conclusions I've come to is that it, it's it's much more important to pray and be charitable to your neighbors than it is to come up with some kind of perfect system for how, how everything should work. I sometimes I sometimes believe that, but um, that? but <laughs> but uh, a lot of the time I don't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, for me in my town, to that that's that's the answer I came up with. But uh, I think yeah, yeah, I think you have a different a different thing going on. I I, I think it's true. It, it's just it's hard to. Yeah, it's hard not to kind of go into the politics mode and try to change things and move things along and, and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Nate, what do you think the church is since, since you're the one who wants to ask this? I was well, actually I, gonna bring up one more example. Oh, okay, um, go ahead. Go for it. Of traditional versus um, tradi of liberal communities in the Hutterites. Like this is a recent example that I think crystallized some of some of some of the problems so um like most like everyone else in the world the Hutterites had the same hubaloo around covid so there were some communities that were more um that were more restrictive and had more 
travel restrictions and following guidelines and other communities that were sort of just like the wild west and doing whatever they want and we're not going to follow the orders and we're going to resist and whatever so we had for we had a few months and maybe a whole, whole year of kind of arguing amongst ourselves about how we should be responding to covid should we be taking the vaccine blah 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 like there was the whole yeah there were colonies lined up on all kinds of different sides and then um here in canada we had the infamous trucker protest um and the trucker thing came at a kind of uh sort of it was sort of the breaking point of um the conservatives who who just were sort of completely fed up with the endless restrictions and and seeming no end to uh you know the, the restrictions around covid and what ended up happening is that um a lot of hutterites ended up um participating in the protest so people showed up with their trucks people showed up with food with signs um and just en masse decided to take part in the protest um and it was for me it was just such a surreal moment because um i don't think there has ever been a case a, a situation where hutterites have actually participated in protests like we've had traditionally been sort of had a sense of non-involvement in politics non-involvement in protests and now suddenly the whole hutterite world was just sort of full on all in on this protest um they are holding signs they are participating in the march there i think there are even some hutterite trucks in ottawa um uh, so so it was just such a surreal moment um and what kind of astonished me was not uh, was not the politics of it like i i completely understand the sentiment behind the the trucker protest like i i sympathize with it i um i completely get the frustration i get the need for protest i'm glad they protested um but to have so many hutterites just sort of on mass without any thought without any reflection just decide to chuck the traditional hutterite stance on um on, on participating in protests participating in politics um i mean we can definitely debate the merits of not participating in politics like <laughs> i'm not i'm not suggesting it's necessarily the the best way to go but to just have it in a, a kind of moment of 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 emotion just kind of thrown out the window um was absolutely surreal um and then in the in the response from church leaders there was there was there was a, from our from the more from the more liberal side of 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 the church there was no um there was no response saying you know traditionally this is what hutterites have done and now we've decided to change or traditionally hutterites have done this and um all you people shouldn't have participated in the protest this is not what hutterites do there was none of that there was there was even a it seemed like people didn't even notice that anything had changed and then but on the other hand from the conservative side there was a letter that came out where the where the conservative leader said uh you know um traditionally hutterites have not participated in protests and um all you guys shouldn't have done this and this is not uh, what we stand for and um you know uh, get back to non involvement and um so basically kind of condemning the whole thing um but it was just surreal to see the, that the conservative side was noticing that some radical shift had taken place but but the liberal side of the church was like well nothing to see here guys nothing happened at all um and so that was that was a pretty yeah I, i i felt like this was a a kind of watershed moment that nobody noticed happening like i think um things are going to be very different in the future for the hutterites but i don't know if many people noticed what was happening so yeah oh, that was that's pretty, interesting what yeah. so what risks are you now exposed to or like in terms of how your community might change through through your involvement in this kind of stuff well the the biggest one i can think of is now that we've decided we're going to be involved in 
public protests and um, more political engagement, that just opens us up to all the kind of awful political dynamics that happened within a conservative community. So we're going to be um, drawn into Trumpism more, nationalism. Like, I, I just think it's, <laughs> it's not going to be good. Like, many of these kind of uh, old kind of traditional things about, well, we don't get involved in politics. I mean, it's, it, it can lead to an indifferentism towards what's going on in the world. But at least it's a kind of um, barrier, a kind of, um, it kind of stops you from, from getting pulled into some of these awful political movements. And so, yeah, I just think we're going to become way more politicized. We're going to become more, yeah, it's, it's just going to accelerate on that end. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a that's another example of um, of some of these dynamics. Can you talk about like a little bit about the reasoning, like why for the traditional HUD right stance of why you have a stance of non involvement and why that would be such a radical departure for for the, for those of us or the, not for, for people who might be listening who don't really understand what that's about and would be like, why? What? That's a big deal. Why couldn't they go out and you know? Yeah, express their view. Explain like why that why the Hutterites hold that position and and why they have that tradition. Well, I guess I guess it just um, it would kind of go back to the traditional Anabaptist idea of the two swords, um, where you have this the kind of secular sword of the state and then the the spiritual sword of the church, where the church doesn't wield this the the sword of the state, doesn't engage in violence, it doesn't um, try to sort of move politics along by force. But instead, it, it has this spiritual force of, of God's kingdom and kind of acts in the world um, by, yeah, by being a different kind of community presence. And it's a and and from on that view, it is a yeah. political entity of its in its own right. Yeah, mm, which right. means and that being colonized by larger political yeah. entities. Yeah, right. And, and, so and that vision is, is the... just and that vision is just completely missing. Like there's there's no sense that you know, as a Hutterite church, we are actually engaging in politics just by being being the church, just by right. being a different kind of weird mm -hmm. community that, um, <laughs> that, that hypothetically wouldn't be as determined by debates over, over vaccines or not vaccines or COVID or not COVID, that we would be able to have a degree mm -hmm. of reconciliation amongst ourselves that could be an example to the wider, wider, wider society. But no, we've we've decided to, to go play politics and divide our communities over this and um, try to move uh, the levers of power in, in one direction, um, so. Yeah, I think that matches up with Paul Vanderclay's advice on the culture war, which I really appreciated back when he was talking about that a lot, right? Because I, one of the things I got disillusioned with about being a, a conservative Catholic TM was that you are, you do get very drawn into all these culture war fights, but but really following Christ is something else, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not just being a, it's not being a side of the culture war. That's a, that's right. an impoverished version of, of what it is to be a Christian. But it, I, I liked Paul's positive vision of what you should actually be doing. And it's kind of like what you described, Julian. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. 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 Um, so so yeah. Why, do, why do you think this idea, okay, so the Hutterites, uh, uh, you know, have to some extent, obviously maybe that's breaking down now, but they've kept this idea of the church as an alternative polis alive, which seems to me to be kind of like obvious from the gospel of the kingdom. I don't really see how, I don't really see how you can see that as any other way. Yeah. Any other way. Uh, and I'm open to being corrected on this, but it seems obvious to me that that's what Jesus is talking about. Yeah. I wouldn't call it a kingdom if it wasn't a, a political struct, but it's, it's different. Here's the thing that's different about it because unlike the traditional polis of the world which has always been in ha, had a hostile relationship to the oikos to the to, to the family to the household mm -hmm. the 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 what is envisioned by christ becomes a family yeah it's a spiritual family yeah it is a spiritual family and it is a and it is a political entity and it's a political entity that's set apart from the political entities that are represented by Caesar. 
I've, I've thought that you could boil the essence of the gospel down to God is love. Um, and Nate, you might see where I'm going with this, but um, that, that kind of personalist essence that's, that's embodied there where you have God is literally love because he is this community of a person that, 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 is, that is continually engaged in this act of, God is this act of self-giving love amongst the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, and one of the... Which makes God a, 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 a perpetual mediation between unity and multiplicity. That too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and one of the, the early Hutterite writers has this really interesting defense of community of goods where he grounds it in the Trinitarian act of self-giving. So the father gives himself to the son and the son gives himself to the father and the spirit. And just so the, the community um, sort of in, 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 in community of goods, each person sort of gives his entire self and, the, and it's filled by the, the self-giving of the other. And, and so community kind of grows out of this grounded, the sort of grounded and grows out of this um, Trinitarian love, which, um, which, which takes root in a real way in, in the world. Which is what um, divine authority is, by the way. It can't be separated from that essence of that essence of God as love. Like that's that's, which is why, which is why Jesus's passion is the ultimate display of authority, even though it appears to the eyes of the world to be weakness. Hmm. Because it's the ultimate act of love. That's what makes it the supreme authority, the final authority. Because it's more real than the kind of political power games of the world. Um, it's right. More, yeah. It's it, yeah. Because power is the root of idolatry. That's the th that's the, that's the <laughs> the move to grasp and take what would have been given as a gift. And and I think talking about love here brings us back to some of the dynamics of, of how a community can go wrong be, be, because I think ultimately love has to be the foundation of, of life and community. Like it can't be uh, fear or it can't be despair. It can't be um, some kind of enemy. And it has to be an outflow of, of Trinitarian love. It has to sort of be grounded in that spiritual life. Um, yeah. <laughs> which I, again we should probably we should probably emphasize that <laughs> laura you aren't saying that your um betting adoption people are are deficient in in love or anything like that no <laughs> I, I wouldn't suggest that either they, yeah. they, they it may very they may very well and who knows i i wish them the i think what they're trying to do is is a good thing and i yeah. wish them only success i really mm. do and here's what i wish here's what i wish i wish the church would help because I think the, the idea that laity can accomplish this, and I think this is moving forward what is going to have to be done because of what's happening in our world, the fact that laity are having to go out and do this with very minimal support from, from the church hierarchy is a bad sign. I think what we need to happen, yeah, what we need to see happening is something mm -hmm. more like what happened with the Celtic monasteries, where they were a collaboration between the monks and laity and hmm. building those communities That's very and those communities were not yeah. isolated they were not totally isolated and not they were very much like in the world but not of the world communities those celtic mm. monasteries too yeah and also we should emphasize that rod dreyer because this is a common mistake about the benedict option rod dreyer is not telling people to flee from civilization and go live right. in the wilderness and make an isolated little community i mean you can do that that would be one option mm -hmm. but um but he talks a lot in his book about um, things like exile in place, as he terms it, like, you know, you stay in the place you're from where you have roots, but you withdraw in some sense in order to preserve some things and you, you group together with other people in your area. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he talks about the importance of stability to the Benedictine monks and he connects it to his sister who, you know, he's, he wrote a whole book about his sister, but his sister was very, connected in the area that they were that they both grew up in because she stayed there and he left right and she formed all these really deep connections with people that turned out to have a big impact on the community and on you know her own life and her family and stuff so he he doesn't recommend that people necessarily yeah. leave the place that they're rooted in and i i would also recommend that if you're rooted in a place you should stay there and do your best 
in that place. And that you should stay connected to your extended family, even if they're like not as religious as you. I mean, unless there's something horrible about your extended family that you can't interact with them at all, you should, you should keep your connections to them. Partly because if what you're looking for is support in raising a family and stuff, they're, even if they don't agree with you about everything, they're still gonna support you more than people who are just living with you because they agree with you about stuff, right? <laughs> because mm -hmm. you know your mom is gonna come and help you take care of your baby in a way that like, you know, you're a, a, a person you know who lives a couple streets over who you're just in a sort of arrangement with is, is gonna help you, right? That other person, that other person would like to help you, but they're not your mom, you know? And so I think- I, I recommend staying where you are. I think also, <laughs> being staying connected with your with your family especially if you're joining like some radical family adoption community that also helps to kind of break out of the the group think of the community and yeah and, and help you to see some of some of the, the dynamics that are happening in in a community that can be that can be bad and, and and so sort of having a bit of distance that might be helpful there to sort of um, be able to kind of step back and see it from a different perspective while you're in it. <clears throat> that's, that's certainly how I often feel within my own community is I, I often feel like I'm both an insider and an outsider at the same time where I can sort of step back and, and, and see some of what's going on, but I'm also an insider and can, can not kind of know the dynamics from the inside, but it's a strange, um, it's a strange path to walk to kind of, uh, be able to see, be able to step back and step in simultaneously. Um, yeah, I, even that shift, like even um, that kind of modern stepping back, um, that, that's again, a kind of genie you can't put back in a bottle. Um, and what, what kind of keeps a lot of older communities together is is the fact that all of them are insiders and they have a, a kind of negative view of outsiders. And um, there's a kind of group dynamic that gets built uh, about, yeah, we are in and all you guys are out and, and this is the best way to be. And all you guys out there are just stupid and immoral, um, which, I mean, that's a, that's a very, uh, you know, uh, inaccurate portrayal of, of, of other rights or other traditional communities. But I think there is more of a, a kind of in, in group dynamic that um, once you're able to sort of be in both worlds at the same time, once you're both, like most of us are, we're both secular and Christian at the same time. We're both, uh, we're cross pressured um, by the secular world. It's, yeah, it's harder to have that um, all in kind of dynamic. And I wonder, is that, <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing, um, or is it just reality? Like, what? What do you think? Yeah, I wow, think that's a... just reality. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably just reality. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there has to be room for a margin, as we like to say in this part of the internet. There has to be some ambiguity. There, it's yeah. You can't like when I when Paul and I were talking about putting walls around things, right? And how how high and how thick your walls have to be. And then there's the question of what are you going to put a wall around? Because um, when I think of the various conservative Catholic projects I've seen, I think the ones that were more successful or had fewer problems were the ones where people were putting a wall around one pretty limited thing, not trying to put a wall around the lives of a large number of families, right? So. Like maybe they all started a school together in a, in a major city somewhere. And the wall was around the school, right? Who can teach at the school? What, what, what books are in the school curriculum? What priests come to preach at the school masses? All that kind of stuff. That was super controlled. But then what the families who go to the school are doing on their own time is entirely their business right mm -hmm. um i think there's some value to that for people who have grown up as you know standard modern people that might be a better idea than trying to do a whole new thing mm -hmm. where, right. where the wall is around your whole town right yeah. and so the, the the real the real trick might be 
here's what I'm thinking. The real trick might be to build community where you are rather than to attempt to build a community mm, like some yeah. some place else. Yeah. How yeah, how can you nurture these good things? And that, um right. That means becoming a human being. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and not merely an individual <laughs> but i guess i guess that is that while that is true you you do have to be aware of you know the social forces that that kind of make that kind of impinge against doing those kinds of experiments um locally um and there's just certain things you can do as a community that you can't do with your family um or as an individual that um yeah i think that's a that's just a reality um, Although people might be surprised if they look around the place where they already live, they might be surprised at how many right. people agree with them about a lot and yeah. would, and and would cooperate with them a lot in certain endeavors. Um, yeah, I think yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think I think this focus on 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 these very specific culture war issues kind of misses the fact that um, just as human beings, there's so much that we have in common, like the, the connection with nature, the, um, you know, children um, go down the line. Like there, there's just mm -hmm. basic things that um, you can build community around um, with your neighbors that I think everyone could sort of get behind. Um, that, would mean that, us, that would mean that us suburbanites would have to actually start talking to our neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, there. How, what are, how do you how do you encounter your neighbor in in suburbia? Like, how do you? What are the places you can? So you get know, when together? I was growing when I was growing up in the suburbs, and it was one of the the later suburbs, the ones that are totally car based, um, and far from you know places where you're your house is not within walking distance of any stores, you know, that, that kind of suburb. Um, the families on my, the families in my section of the suburb were very interconnected. Um, and we had social events, you know, there was always a Christmas party that bounced around to different houses every year, right? And everybody would come to it. And there was wow. like a 4th of July <clears throat> grilling party and stuff. And, uh, you know, people got along well and they knew each other really well. The kids were running around outside with no one paying attention to them, playing in vacant lots or checking out like new constructions, all that kind of thing. So that, that was a subject. I've had, I've had, like very, I've had variable experiences. Summer. I've had variable experiences in my life. Like, you know, the last neighborhood I lived in before where I lived in now, like we knew our neighbors pretty well. Everybody was really friendly. It was great. But then the neighborhood I live in now, it's... <laughs> It's just like but, people aren't really. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but what's the changed? What's changed isn't that it's a suburb though, because like the the neighborhood I grew up in. If you go there now, people don't know each other, right? And they don't interact much. So what right. what changed? It wasn't the. It wasn't just the neighborhood. It's like it's not just the physical construction of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It was something that happened in people's minds that made. But them not just us. Like right. there's technological and and social forces at play too. Yeah. yeah, definitely. But I think this is something that we can still change. We're not, I'm not kind of like putting a little pressure on myself here too, because like if someone begin, I think all it takes it may only take one person to begin to make the effort, mm -hmm. right? To break that. Yeah. Like I can, I can, I can think of like my mom was from the south, so it's like every time we moved into a new neighborhood when I was a kid, she would like, she'd go and bring baked goods to the neighbors and introduce herself. Yeah, you know, and introduce us. She mm -hmm. she make us go with her. Yeah, well, in and my I, neighborhood, it was so your mom uh, used to take things to when the, when you guys moved in. Yeah, when we moved in, she would go. Things. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Because in my neighborhood, it was the opposite. It was that if right. you saw new well, people moving she did in, that you had to go bring them bacon. She did that. She, she had been living <laughs> on the West Coast long enough to know that it was never going to happen unless she did it. So oh. she took the initiative to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that sounds to me like buying other people presents on your birthday. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if it works, sure. <laughs> you can also just have something like a bonfire and tell people, hey, there's a bonfire in my back yeah. backyard. Uh, yeah, 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 like yeah, in absolutely. my current neighborhood, I think some people would show up if I did that. Yeah. There you go. So, but yeah, it's but something it's always... to do. so instead of complaining <laughs> about it, this is like a practical thing that can be right. done. It's like, hey, why don't you actually make the effort to 
form a more of a sense of community in your neighborhood by being the one who is the catalyst for that. So I have tried to do that. And my experience in, in the current year has been that some people really appreciate it and some people think it's creepy. Yeah. Right? yeah. It, it, I don't think anybody used to think it was creepy to try to get to know your neighbors, but now some right. people think that's creepy. Yep. That's true. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's anything that we can do anything about though. Yeah. I've, I have and, and I think thought. the fact that the fact that there is a certain percentage of people that would not think it was creepy and actually be really glad that it had happened makes it worth doing anyway. And you just yeah. have the fact that some people are going to think it's creepy. That's just, Oh, well, we'll problem. have to deal with that. That's their problem. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a dynamic of, of just being a, a kind of intellectual guy, like, uh, for example, I I would just rather spend a lot of my evenings at home reading a book instead of going to a bonfire or something. Um, but then there's also the, the dynamic of, you know, a big part of your life is, is just reading all these books, thinking about all these ideas. And so it's harder to connect with normal people who talk about mm -hmm. normal stuff. Um, so how do you bridge that kind of a gap? Um, it mm -hmm. can also be a kind of Christian secular gap that it's just... For some people, it might be more extreme. I thought that one thing to do is just get into something like sports. And That's, I was yeah. just going to give you that advice because, <laughs> see, I've always been a sports fan, so it's never been hard for me. So I can, I can, it makes it easy. Well, at least with lots of different kind of men, I don't have any problem yeah. interacting with. Mm -hmm. And like women are usually interested in intellectual things, even if they're not particularly intellectual. In my experience, oh, I found, I've actually found women are, are much easier to talk about intellectual stuff than men. Yep. Well, I, you know, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that before. Can in real life, like things? online, it seems like it's all men. Yeah. Yep. But, but not in real life. I talk, the people I talk to in real life about intellectual stuff who are my age would all be females. But I also have a bunch of older friends who are mostly males, which I would talk about intellectual stuff with. Um, I, I think like I, I talk with a lot of married men about intellectual stuff, <laughs> but I talk with uh, females my age about intellectual stuff and, mm -hmm. and fewer guys except my brothers and something like that. So I don't know. That's that's in real life. And it's a different know. conversation, yeah. too. It's, it's a different conversation. And it's usually a better conversation because a lot of times like when it, when you're having an intellectual conversation with other men, there tends to be a there's a tendency to focus on a lot of minutia and a lot of times when you're having those same conversations with women they'll get they'll get big picture things that that will help you see something that you were missing that's, yeah. that's true but that's you won't true. get I, I, you won't I get when you have the same that, conversation yeah. with men so i know i noticed that as well i also noticed that sometimes if you are listening to a big group of men trying to talk about something super intellectual um egos quite few, yeah quite a few of them are just trying to show off how much they know about the topic so they're just like telling each other stuff but right. they're not really getting anywhere it's just like let me tell you all the facts i know about julius caesar or whatever and then someone else is like well i also know some facts about julius caesar and you know um right Whereas, well i don't know anything I, I like, about julius like, caesar but I do know about genghis khan so let me randomly start talking about genghis khan <laughs> right yeah yes I've, I've seen those conversations yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's why I, I'm really, really would like to have more women in my um, in my estuary group that I, my local estuary group that I have. So that's the other thing I'm doing where I'm at to try to build community. Is oh, I'm, so I'm, an, an I'm an estuary host. Yeah, an in person meetup. Yeah, I'm the only woman in the Chicago estuary meetup. Yep, my wife is the only one in mine in Olympia. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah, but I think, but I think that I in my I think that. It's just the getting women interested in doing it. Cause I think that like, once they were there, I think they would enjoy it. At least because of the experience of a, I've, the experiences I've had in my past, in my past of having intellectual conversations in person with women, I think, well, first of all, the SRE group is worse off for not having more women because of the dynamics that I just mentioned. And then second of all, I actually do think that they would enjoy it. Mm -hmm. As long as it's not, but it has to be balanced. The problem is it's really like my wife will say it's really hard for her to be the only woman in the group that's tougher. She still comes though. I think mainly for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think makes it hard for her? Does she say? Well, she's both the only woman and the only Jew. So that's, 
<laughs> so she's traveling she's having to represent on both fronts there um uh -huh. so i i just think that i think she just would like it more if there were more women mm -hmm. so yeah hmm. so the um the the negative side of having serious discussions with women i think is that um women tend to like anecdotes i like anecdotes but you'll notice that with certain women, if they're not very good at conversation, what they'll tend to be doing is that they're just telling you a lot of stories, but it's not always easy to figure out what the point of the story is, right? And so you'll tell them one thing and then they'll be like, well, I knew somebody who blah, 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 and then <laughs> it'll be a story about something. Um, and they can't always, sometimes it's not clear why they told you that, and they can't always explain why they told you that, you know? And then I wonder, is this person telling me the story in order to counter a point I just made, or illustrate the point I made, or is it just that this, that what I said tangentially reminded them of the story, you know? I think that's the difficult thing sometimes about conversation. You know, that's interesting. You just explained something about the dynamics of the, of the grail country conversations that I wouldn't, hadn't noticed before, but that is like, oh. like Sherry's like default for, is to relate anecdotes. Like, like that's a really strong uh -huh. go-to for her in our conversations. I usually am able to understand what she's trying to illustrate with her anecdotes, but mm -hmm. But, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm sure he's smart. I think her yeah. headphones are good. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if this is this is true or just a generalization, but I I, I find women are, are more interested in relational conversations or um, personal conversations. Um, so how can we make this idea connect with your real life? Um, mm -hmm. mm, but, and that's good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm which is helpful for someone like me but yeah that's um, that's i think and, and in terms of to put it in the context of the estuary like that's one of the reasons i think that in we built in the to the estuary protocol like the opening to talk about personal things like that's mm. part of it it's not it's not supposed to be just only intellectual conversations all the time if there's something mm. happening in your life you know, personally or contextually, that's, that's more salient to you than whatever, you know, books you've read or podcasts you've listened to, then that's also on the table to bring up. So. Do you find that, um, I wonder if, do men enjoy talking with women more or women talk? Yeah, I don't know if that's true. Depends on the women probably. Or vice versa. Um, I, I, yeah, but, but there's definitely something about just the conversation among guys that, that well, is. Sherry's definitely one of my favorite conversation partners. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy the the men I have conversations with too. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, kind of gets like Mike, gets Michael Martin. Folks. Michael Martin's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking to that guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think I have a preference for talking to either men or women. Like it's a slightly different experience, but I like both of them. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we could circle back to something. I forget what the comment was where I wanted to bring this up. Um, I wanted to talk about a, an annoyance I have with evangelicals talking about witness all the time. Mm. Um, but I forgot what the context was of... Was it, was it that witness is defined too intellectually and not enough in terms of how you're living your life? Um, not quite. Okay. I'm, I'm just Let's trying to, <laughs> to connect this back to what the conversation was we were having. Um, yeah, I for completely forgot it. Um, Does it have to do with like the connection with martyrdom? Like in terms of the etymology of martyr? Oh, oh well, that, yeah, that would probably be a different way of, that would be a more helpful way of thinking about it. But I just find that... Um, it seems like often when evangelicals, I don't know if this is the right word. I'm sorry, evangelicals. I don't mean to call you out like everyone else always is. But <laughs> 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 they should just get off on that word already. It's like everything that's wrong with Christianity, evangelical. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just the way certain people use the word witness is like, um, well, I really need to watch what I say around secular people because they might get offended and not believe the gospel. And it's, oh. it, 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 it just kind of seems 
propagandistic and inauthentic to me the way it gets used it's um huh so not wanting to offend secular people right so like not mentioning not mentioning mentioning a a, a belief that you have that might seem well it's offensive to them or well it's something like um when you're talking about politics people will say well uh voting for trump was um very bad for the the christian witness mm. and oh. it just seems like a form of nominalism where you're like mm. you know there's nothing specific about voting for trump that we can point out that was bad there's nothing about the the movement there that we think is objectionable there's nothing about the christian engagement to politics that we think could be improved it's just these people over there might be offended by this so we should probably play that down and oh, and, and you're <laughs> missing the larger conversation about um well is there actually anything wrong with um this political movement and we should be aligning for these real reasons instead of just um the the public relations front being offended so mm -hmm. i i'm so I, I often public find, relations mindset i often find that talking about a witness kind of uh di um, how, how do you put it? it? It sort of hides the deeper issues and creates a very superficial conversation. Um, oh, yeah, because it's all about how you're presenting yourself and yeah. whether you're doing it and get it in a way that'll like sell the gospel to people. Right? There's, and, and, there's, there's, <laughs> and it's like you're not, if, if you're always in the kind of admin public relations mm -hmm. mode, you're, you're actually not really um, bringing the gospel to life because you're just pretending to be someone who you, who you actually aren't um, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, so, that kind of reminds me of how people who get really into this culture war mindset can get so defensive about their faith that they would not be willing to tell anyone about things that they struggle with in their faith or you know things that they just mm -hmm. find unpleasant about the Christian life or whatever. But it might actually be really helpful to uh, outsiders exactly. to hear about that stuff. Yeah. yeah exactly it's exactly the same thing yeah um then i think the antidote to paul and this corner is is just the honesty of yeah okay i believe this but i actually also am cross pressured by this or um i think this but i also see the merit of that and um i'm <laughs> the, just the way paul talks about his consciousness congress and how Part of him is, is, is an atheist, part of him is a Christian, part of him mm -hmm. is something else. I think that's such a helpful way of talking. Yeah, um, I agree. For me personally, this estuary environment has been much, much better spiritually than the super mm -hmm. Catholic environment that I tried to be a part of before. And you yeah. know, your mileage may vary. Some people might do great in the super Catholic environment, but, but um, in my life, the, the estuary has definitely been more helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely done a lot for me too. Mm -hmm. um, I was just now. I'm just trying to figure out what was I, what was my brain connecting witness oh, yeah. <laughs> with, um, with the conversation we're having about the Benedict option. I'm not sure. Um, it had something to do with borders, and uh, I can't remember. It was it was what you said just before we were talking about how a community needs to have either porous borders or just borders around certain things. Or, oh, just putting walls around stuff and how yeah. high and how, yeah, how porous can they be? Hmm. Well, Paul is pessimistic about the idea of putting walls around anything these days because he feels like the presence of the walls affects what goes on inside the walls mm. um, in ways that might be negative. And it's futile because it's it's um you're just not, you're not going to succeed in keeping things out or at least not you know forever i don't know yeah yeah but i guess we should let we should let paul say that himself because uh, i'm just trying to summarize his view there yeah the the internet has has kind of um just destroyed yeah, like the, can, the, right. the borders around tradi the traditional borders that how the rights have set up to like yeah gone. if a bunch of families do all group together and and like sign a contract that none of them are going to have the internet in their homes then you can maintain a wall for a while mm -hmm. but how many people can really do that like i i need the internet to make money um 
a lot yeah. of people do. So yeah, not not feasible for a lot of people. You would like to be free from that dependence, I guess. But um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not everything about the internet is bad either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Like most things. Um. Yeah, that is one thing that triggers me a bit about some of the conversations around modernity in in the in these circles is it just gets turned into like an unequivocally bad thing as if modernity didn't bring all kinds of things we can affirm and um, and can't really get rid of and um, are good and um, you know yeah and, yeah and, and they shape and us. ignores the dark side of tradition which i yeah. think which i think which the exposure of the dark side of tradition is is one of the things that christianity did mm -hmm. like that's <laughs> like the passion ex the passion of christ exposes the dark side of tradition like especially yeah. if you think about it in in term, in girardian terms that's becomes particularly obvious where it's like literally like you know exposes the you know the evil of the sacrificial uh, you know the hidden sacrificial mechanism that makes the m that makes the traditional world function mm -hmm. yeah shirley jackson's story the lottery would be one of my go-tos for acquainting people with the dark side of tradition right mm -hmm. right i'm well acquainted with it <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, or like my parents you know my parents both grew up in small towns in the united states and they were my dad was born in 1933 my mom was born in 1938 and you know, then I knew my grandparents as well, who were who were born in like I don't know, nineteen twelve and nineteen fifteen, something like that. Um, so I'm very familiar with like what small town life used to be like, and it was idyllic in some ways, and there were some things that were really great about it. But then once in a while, you hear stories that make you think, "Wow, that was." Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to live, <laughs> live with that particular problem. You know. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in some ways, this, in some ways, I wonder if I, I, maybe I'm crazy here. I'm under, I'm wondering if some in some ways, like obviously, there's a dark aspect to what's going on, uh, in you know, in modernity as well. But isn't like isn't the advance of of modernity in some ways also represent like somehow like the the drawing nearer of the kingdom, mm -hmm. which is what, which might be what's causing all these things to fall apart. Mm. Yeah, the only way out is through is one of the things people keep saying. Which means that our um, politics yesterday. are just going to get worse and worse because, because yeah, that's what I'm expecting. Because because our politics are not <clears throat> based on kingdom principles, so yeah. they're. <laughs> yeah, I'm certainly not at this. I haven't. I can't remember, I don't think I've ever thought that, oh, there's a person I can vote for who will turn things around and make it all better. I, I don't expect that to happen at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there, yeah. and, and if there were, they wouldn't be, they'd be unelectable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, they just would be. <laughs> I'm gonna crucify him. I mean that the yes. person, the person who would be electable to turn every, who everybody thinks would turn every, ever, to turn everything around, will end up being antichrist. I mean, that's, yeah. So, and we don't like, we don't like it when people turn everything around. Like we, we like our our little rots, and um, the turning yeah. of the ages isn't very comfortable for most of us. So. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot left to discuss. Like what. What are some other communal dynamics we need to uh, explore? Well, maybe I could, I don't know how much longer we're gonna talk, but I can, I can say something that might sum up um, some of what I'm trying to tell people. Go for so it. So again, from this book, so Eric Brandy, he, you know, he lived with uh, these Amish people for a while and he was really inspired by their way of life and he was Catholic. So he bought some land in the area where they lived. And he thought maybe I can start a Catholic community that operates along similar lines to this community. Um, and he only wrote he only wrote one paragraph about that experiment in the book, but here it is. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> um, yeah, we left Boston for a few months and got involved in forming a rural neighborhood association, patterned after that of the Mennonites, with others who wished to regulate the use of technology. The project proved to be a brief but instructive last use of the land we had bought. We learned that in its early stages. A fledgling community is very fragile and requires the right blend of many ingredients, including personal outlooks. It presumes a certain level of psychological stability. 
If any ingredient is missing, the whole thing can quickly cave in, and thus, like a failed souffle, did this one. We sold the property, mourning the loss of our last tie to our original experiment. So that's all he says. <laughs> but I think, I think this one line, this one line, um, um, it presumes a certain level of psychological stability is doing a lot of work. <laughs> but we can, like, some, some of the things we said in this conversation, we can kind of see why that went wrong, right? Because yeah. he went to this place where he had seen these people who, how, who knows how long they had been there, by the way. Yeah. Like they'd probably been there for a very, very long time. And he sees them, you know, after a long period of development where they develop mm. the stable thing and he thinks that he can just like go out buy a piece of land in the same area and get a bunch of other people that have no roots in that place and move them to that location and then and somehow they don't make it work and, and then it doesn't work and he's surprised mm -hmm. which is why this whole idea of doing what you can to build community like real community real christian community where you are is probably the much more advisable option in the long mm -hmm. run i would say yeah i agree mm. yeah <laughs> in your case julian you're just where you know i mean you had it was ready made it was just there yeah. for you <laughs> <laughs> congratulations uh, and yeah. i would say i would say that is one, that's the other thing that i would say is that christians who who like feel like that they want to be a part of that like the other option is rather than to go and try to create their own thing which is a very individualistic sort of capitalist kind of thing. It's almost, it's very entrepreneurial, individualistic, capitalistic mm -hmm. is to just go and find a community that already exists and has some history behind it and be a part of that community. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that, um, that is, that, that puts new life into the existing community as well. Which I would say from time. a Catholic perspective, which means that laity should start to do more to collaborate with the work of the monasteries. Yeah, that would how to do that would be a whole discussion. But yeah, yeah, that, that I, and, and I just I didn't even think of it until this conversation. Mm. But that seems to be like the proper Catholic expression of that is like, oh, we already have these monasteries. How can we? How can we support them? Yeah, I guess yeah, those monasteries. Yeah, um, yeah. Charles Taylor talks about the the one speed versus the two speed, but well, not, it doesn't use those, those words. That's Paul's language of the, the one speed and the two speed. Yeah. That's, um, is, is that Paul's uh, translation of Charles Taylor? I think it's Paul's translation of Charles Taylor, but you have, you have kind of the, the people like the monks who are uh, kind of living the, the extreme full, full on expression of the radical demands of, of the gospel. And then people who, um, live a more, I don't know, how do you actually describe the difference without <laughs> making the normal people sound like um, subpar Christians? But um, yeah. I guess I guess people who just live a less, less radical lifestyle and mm -hmm. and how you sort of need, yeah. It, I've, I've been interested in thinking about those dynamics within the Hutterite community where it starts out as a, an attempt to have a one speed religion where you have everyone in the community um, who is sort of on the same page and everyone is living out the, the full radical demands of the gospel. But I think over time, a kind of equilibrium uh, starts to develop. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've thought about this in terms of, 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 of apocalyptic um, versus natural law or something like that, where the equilibrium that a community kind of goes into, where you have the two speed, you have the carnival, you have the hierarchies. And then there's these apocalyptic moments where a kind of radical uh, one speed egalitarian um, uh, kind of vision breaks out. And it's always just a brief, moment it, it never kind of is able to last for more than a few more than a decade or a few years and then it sort of comes back into that that older sort of settled natural law kind of space um i mean <laughs> i've do you think it's accurate to say that that catholicism kind of represents just sort of 
um, the natural the, the natural equilibrium, the, the kind of natural the natural law, like what it, given enough time, what kind of religion becomes without the, the apocalyptic breaking in. Um, without mm. But but I guess you ha do have the mo the monasteries. I have to write that question down and think about it for a few days before answering it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I guess I've just thought in terms of of the ritual, the um, the hierarchy, the um, all of those, the tradition, all of those beautiful things mm -hmm. that people love about the Catholic tradition. I think um, that is sort of what a apocalyptic religion develops into given enough time um mm -hmm. yeah what do you think that, yeah that that makes a certain kind of sense to me yeah um yeah but but i guess the irony is that um it doesn't seem possible to have an established church or that that doesn't kind of come back into that older mode. Um, and so should you continue to sort of resist and continually seek those hmm. authentic apocalyptic moments or should you sort of just uh, let the, embrace the tradition, embrace the natural law? Well, and to, to some extent there, you can have both because yeah, something, that, something that Catholics are accustomed to is this tension between the the institutional church and the spirit-filled things that can happen mm -hmm. you know um in in the life of the church right the institutional church has a certain rigidity or um bureaucratic quality right and it has all the flaws that everyone's well aware of and yet there's this other we're saying two speeds. Yeah, there's like another speed or another track that exists in the same church that's that's on more spiritual level level where like amazing things happen. And, and yeah, it may move, are, are and I would say that even though it may move slowly, it is still transformed by the apocalyptic vision and has never yeah. lost it. It's just well, it's, that, that is what it just has a is. certain stability that keeps it from changing too rapidly in response to that apocalyptic vision. And a recurring theme in the stories of saints is that maybe a saint has a vision, like a direct vision of Christ, where he tells them to do a certain thing or spread a certain message, right? And then maybe that person gets in trouble with the hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? And their local bishop yeah. says, no, stop, stop telling this message. I'm not so sure about this. Then what the saint is supposed to do is just accept that for a while and assume that God's will is going to prevail, right? And so you, right. there's there's that tension showing up again, right? You've got to accept, you have to accept that institutional church and the way it works, mm -hmm. but you also have faith that if if God is planning to do a thing, that thing will come to pass. So, so if Luther had just waited awesome. it out, he might have become a saint. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the Catholic position, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like if you're Luther, you wait it out. And then you will eventually discover, was I a heretic or was I a saint? Right, <laughs> <You know>? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but someone else will tell you. It's like, it's kind of like how Peterson says, you know, your identity is something that you negotiate with other people. Um, yeah. right. If there's a new thing you want to do in the church, you can't be told, you can't be sure on your own that you're right. You've got to, you've got to negotiate it with, with the other people, with the hierarchy, with which yeah, is a very personal, which is a very personalist thing for him to say. You said Peterson says that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've heard that too. He's it's in Peterson's interesting because he's like, sometimes he sounds like a pure modernist individualist in the way he talks about the individual. And then sometimes it's like, he has a vision that's more in line with Christian personalism. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I wish I, I I hope he gets to the point where he can articulate that more clearly. But I think maybe he it needs to be a Christian me, before he can. It sounded to me like what it went through with um with his illness taught him some personalism. Um hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I definitely feel the apocalyptic traditional tension in my own in my own life. Like there's there are times where I can really see the you know some of what we talked about today, like some of these traditions and the value and the goodness there. Um, and there's other times where you're just hoping for this apocalyptic moment, which will just sweep away this entire godforsaken tradition once and for all, and just return us to this. Um, barren landscape we just have to figure it out for ourselves um, yeah so I'm sure there's Catholics who fantasize about that too or it's like just God, oh, yeah, I think so, drop yeah. your divine nuke upon this entire hierarchy <laughs> uh, uh, yeah um, sure. but uh, <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> have you Did read you, uh, have you read David Billy Hart's recent book Tradition and Apocalypse I haven't. No. Okay. No. You might want to read it based on what, since you're kind of talking in that vein. Um, David's primary thesis in that book is that um, the proper way to read the tradition is through apocalypse because mm -hmm. you have to see the telos of a thing. You have to see the telos of the tradition in order to understand the tradition. And you can't know, but you can't, you can only know the telos by looking at its apocalyptic mode through the po apocalyptic mode mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's something slightly different but probably related yeah i was thinking when i saw the title of that book that that was something i would probably be interested in but i haven't checked it out yet yeah. um it's a pretty quick read it's not I think it's like less than 200 pages um can i read you something from the dust jacket of this translation of the new testament if i just yeah. remember and get it yeah absolutely I think I have one. I have a copy behind me too. Is it the white? Well, I, I really no, no, no. It's it's actually it's the it's on my. I have a I have a a a, a dresser behind me, and there's more books oh. on top of there. Okay. I usually can't. If I move, you can kind of see. I think I can see it now. Yeah, it's the white one. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe this will give you two something to talk about. Um. So here's David Bentley Hart's translation of the New Testament and the dust jacket says, this rendering also challenges the idea that the New Testament affirms the kind of people we are. Hart reminds us that the first Christians were a company of extremists, radical in their rejection of the values and priorities of society, not only at its most degenerate, but often at its most reasonable and decent. <laughs> to live as the New Testament language requires, he writes, Christians would have to become strangers and sojourners on the earth to have here no enduring city, to belong to a kingdom truly not of this world. And we surely cannot do that, can we? I love it, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, it's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. Um, on a completely different note, do any of you regularly read the blog of Rod Dreher? Um, I do. you regularly read it? How, how I do, are... it scares the hell out of me, and I really shouldn't read it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's so oh, yeah, bad for me. A... I, Sometimes I like yeah. I just say I'm not going to look at it for a month, and then like my whole life gets better. And that's exactly my relationship with it. I have such yeah. a love hate <laughs> relationship with him. Like, um, I th I think part of the reason I keep reading him is that I don't know of any other place where you can go and get that kind of cultural analysis alongside uh, you know philosophical stuff and theological yeah. stuff. Yeah, just has that's true. Nice There's no one else quite like him. Yeah fascinating mixture and then he brings yeah. his his personality into it in in a way that can be absolutely bizarre sometimes um i, I think I, mean, I think if i think if rod is like very very close to having the seeds of like becoming a christian anarchist if he became mm -hmm. a christian anarchist and just stopped caring so much about the global politics stuff and i read a paragraph be so much better but yeah, I used to I, read Rod all the time. But I have I don't really read his recent stuff, but I, I used to read him when he was a columnist for National Review all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I used to read him in the early 2000s. And then when he came up with Crunchy Cons, um, my husband and I read it and our friends read it and we were all, you know, passing it back and forth going, oh, this is us, you know, this is totally, this is yep. totally what we're into. Yeah, so yeah, I, I actually rem I remember the, it, I, I, I remember the very first, I remember the very first, uh, um, National Review piece where he introduced the term crunchy con and he was talking about like his wife going to um, the co-op with her National Review tote bag. <laughs> can, I read a, can I read something from from a recent blog post? I'm sure I'm sure you guys saw the the post he wrote surrounding his divorce. Yeah. yeah I just felt um, bad for him. Yeah, yeah I, I, I felt bad, bad for him too. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I one impression I had, well, I don't know, this is probably something you should have in private, but I was so struck by this comment he had um, in the middle of one of his pieces where he was talking about the sword in the stone. And he was talking, I think, about the sword in the stone for him was whether or not he should give up on his marriage and, and just sort of let it go and stop fighting. But I just thought it was such a perfect metaphor for his stance towards the culture war that I was like mm. waiting for to connect the dots, but he never did. So let me just read, read this. Um, so as I sat at that silent crypt this morning, I thought about the sword in the stone. Then I remember that today is Holy Thursday, the day that Jesus Christ was taken to the Garden of Gethsemane to his trial. On that this night, Peter drew his sword to protect the Lord from his enemies, but Jesus told him to put it away and to sur and surrender to his faith. Jesus knew what was about to happen, had to happen for all righteousness to be fulfilled. I heard the inner voice say to me that now was the time to put away my sword. That is, to stop fighting for a restoration of the past. In fact, said the voice, I had done all that, all that at the monastery. I had made a nine year long journey across the empty bath and the flame all, all right. And now I needed to put needed to place it on the stone and to be free. Then it hit me. That stone where I had just been praying was the stone that marks the spot traditionally, and not necessarily literally, where the Romans disc discarded the cross. The inner voice was telling me that the fight was over, that this is about to happen, meaning the dissolution of the marriage had to happen. But why, I asked, why not just restore the marriage? I didn't wait for an answer, but banish the questions. I may never know, but that's beside the point. Why did Jesus have to suffer and die? We are dealing with the deepest mysteries here. I oh, that's just, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, image you're of, right. Of it's the like broken yeah, broken marriage. The image of right. yeah. giving up on the past. To the larger cultural yeah. stance yeah. that he's in. The marriage yeah. of you could think about it. You know, the marriage of the church and state, or something like mm. that. The marriage of there since Christendom and which giving up on the, the past. Mm -hmm. But and the, the, which the sword, the actual sword in the stone, in the in the context of you know Arthurian le legend, like that's what it represents, right? It's like. Because, well, it's first of all, it's, it's the sword that represents royal royal authority, right? But it's like it's 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 it, it stands in a holy place, and it can only be drawn by like the the one who is who is the true and rightful king, which is, means to mm -hmm. be chosen by God. So it's it's the combina it's it's the collaboration between spiritual authority and temporal power in yeah. that image. But I just found that that image there so interesting like i was wondering is it going to connect the dots here is it going to is his tone going to radically change in his future blog posts but um he has so many happen. of the right pieces i just don't yeah i don't i don't really and i don't quite hold it against him because i think he is talking about stuff that few people do and, and so he sort of fills a, a hole it's just i i just can't i just can't stand some of the stuff he puts out um i'm sorry um, yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I think I think he's just um, an extremely emotional person. Like he seems to be giving us what immediately goes through his head when he reads a headline and just sort of sits mm. down and types twenty thousand word <laughs> blog posts. Maybe. <laughs> well, it'll be really interesting to see how he evolves from here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, his, he's been talking more about it in his recent blog posts about how, about um, even some of the Ruth, his sister Ruth stuff, apparently, um, I didn't realize it, but apparently there was some ugly stuff in his family. Yeah, he, so he alludes to it, never been resolved. I'm not sure what it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, well, maybe um, while we're talking about internet people, I can put in a plug for a person who I think is doing a really good job in the Catholic world right now, which is Larry Chapp. Have you ever heard of him? I look him up. I think it was Larry him. Chapp, C H A P P. He has a blog called Gaudium at Space 22. Okay. Yeah, so read some of his blog posts. I highly recommend him as a person who's thinking about Catholicism in the modern world and doing a really great job. All right. Great. Good. Yeah, but I should case. probably split because it's been Me too. Yep. two it's hours. Been, uh, I got we have reached so. our uh, agreed upon uh, time. I think it was a great okay. conversation. I would um, I'd like to talk to either one of you uh, again at, uh, sometime in the future. And uh, thanks for the conversation today. All right. Thanks, I really thanks, enjoyed Julian. this. Yeah. Great. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.